My name is Karen E. Forrester. My father, Captain Ron Forrester, United States Marine Corps, is still missing in action in North Vietnam. He is only one of 1,621 Americans who are still missing from the war in Vietnam. 104 of them are also Texans. He is only one of 3,417 Texans who sacrificed their lives in Vietnam, but he is the only one that I call daddy. My family, like all MIA families, still wait for answers. MIA families, like our Gold Star families, miss their loved ones every day. And we greatly thank our Vietnam veterans, for it is you who stand by our side and hold us up, even though many Vietnam veterans still work to resolve their own demons. And we can't forget the veterans' families because they serve too. For POWMA families, Gold Star families, and for many of our veterans, the Vietnam War is not really over. It really never can be, with the empty chair at the holiday table, the what-ifs, and the constant struggle for closure and healing. This is our reality. This is the cost of war. As a board member with the National League of POWMA families, I have the honor of working with other families like mine and representing them when talking with our government and foreign governments as well. I also share in the celebration that comes with the, any answer to an MIA's fate. And answers do come, they just come very slowly. I'm also a proud participant of Run for the Wall, which is a cross-country pilgrimage that focuses on promoting our veterans' healing calling for a full accounting of our POWs and MIAs, honoring the ultimate sacrifice of those killed in action, and to support our military personnel around the world. Our outreach program looks to embrace MIA and KIA families along our route so that we can let them know their loved one is not forgotten and that we appreciate and understand the family sacrifice. Now, sacrifice is no stranger to any of your panel members here today. While I have just shared with you the reality of life after the war, your panel members will share with you the reality of the war. So please allow me to introduce your panel for this afternoon's session, the troops of you from the front lines. Liz Allen is a graduate of Ohio State University with a master's in psychiatric nursing. She joined the United States Army to help men, like her own brother, who were serving in Vietnam. She requested frontline duty and was assigned to the remote 12th EVAC hospital in Kuchi. In the winter of 1967, she was transferred to a field hospital in Pleiku, soon to come under attack during the Tet Offensive. Completing her tour of duty in April of 1968, she went on to serve 14 years in the U.S. Army Reserves. John Sibley Butler was drafted in the United States Army shortly after graduating from LSU. He served two years in, in Vietnam and was awarded a Bronze Star for Valor in Combat. An author and professor in the management department at the McCombs School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin, his prolific writings include the book, All That We Can Be, which he co-authored with Charles Moskos. He also researched the involvement of African Americans in the Vietnam War. Isaac Camacho enlisted in the United States Army in 1955. He served as an airborne jump instructor before becoming a member of the newly formed 77th Special Forces Group. He served two tours in Vietnam, one in Ashau Valley and the other in the province of Nguyen. In 1963, he was captured and imprisoned by Viet Cong forces and became the first GI to escape a Viet Cong POW camp. He earned the Silver Star and Distinguished Service Cross for his service in Vietnam. Ken Wallingford entered the U.S. Army in 1969. He was sent to Vietnam in 1970 as a sniper with the 25th Infantry Division. A year later, he volunteered for a second tour 
as a military advisor with the Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. In April of 1972, he was captured and imprisoned in the jungles of Cambodia for more than 10 months before being released at the signing of the Paris Peace Accords. He was awarded the Silver Star and the Bronze Star. He is currently the Senior Advisor to the Executive Secretary of the Veterans Land Board. Your moderator today will be Dr. William Adams. William Bro Adams' formal education was interrupted by three years of service in the U.S. Army, including one year as a first lieutenant in the Vietnam War. He credits his experience in Vietnam as part of what motivated him to study and teach in the humanities. He went on to serve as president of Colby College from 2000 to 2014, when in 2014 he became the 10th chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please join me in welcoming your panel to the stage. Well, good, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. We're glad you're here, and we're delighted to be here, and we're looking forward to this uh, hour or so of conversation about our experiences. This is the moment, as uh, President Finbus said, that we have a chance to talk about the experience of being in Vietnam, and that is, of course, one of the most important dimensions uh, of this summit, and that's what we're going uh, to do today. So thank you again for being with us as we... Uh, remember and recall some of the uh, experiences that, that we had. I'm going to start with that very question and ask, starting with Liz and going down uh, the line here, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to talk a little bit about daily life in their units. You've heard described their assignments uh, when they were in Vietnam, generally what they did. But I think it's important to talk a little bit more about what the actual daily life in those units was like. And so I'm going to start with Liz, and you can oh, kick I us off talking about... Oh, I was hoping you was going to do him first. No, no, I'm doing you first. <laughs> Let me tell you, there was no regulation on daily life. It depended on what happened in the field. How many body bags did you get? How many helicopters came in? And living was hell. Excuse me for saying that word, but that's what it was. The temperature was hot. And as those troops came in, how do you come to grips with 150 body bags in one day? I had two stations in Vietnam. Coochie, which you know as the tunnels. The little guys got to do the tunnels because the big guys couldn't get through the hole. But the real thing about the tunnels were the spiders at the end of the tunnel. And as those, we got them. And there was no psychiatric service to help them. There cannot possibly be anything worse than a spider on your face. Part of the things that we have to deal with in war are supplies. There were days that we thought nothing was ever going to come. How do you run? out of ammunition, blood transfusions, and water in a war zone. But day after day, you dealt with it. Talk to, don't let me talk too long. Because <laughs> I love to talk, I ain't gonna lie to you. Because you don't see many women who know about war. And I did Coochie, which you know is the tunnels, and Play Coo, which was the 
took, which took the first bomb of the Tet Offensive. And I tell my friends, don't ever call me at night because the first rounds came in at night. And there was nothing to do and I knew that the phone was gonna ring and I was gonna have to go. And the chief nurse calls and she says, Captain Allen? I says, yes. I said, what do you need me to do? She said, you have to go to the unit. And the unit was further than this wall and that wall. And I said, is somebody gonna go with me? And she said, Captain Allen, I am so sorry. You have to go alone. And as I opened the door, the two nurses that were there with them, the guys were on the floor because they were bringing him in. You can never imagine the carnage of that kind of war. And I say that to you because it's not something that I talk about. How in the hell can you deal with 40 young men, some with no legs, some with no arms, some with their chest open, and you have nothing to give them but love? John, and I I'm know gonna you, pass. Yeah, I know you were in the medical side of things as well, or had a pretty good view of that. Maybe you could well, extend yes. this uh, view of, of what Liz has said. Uh, absolutely. When I think about it, I think of helicopters and, and blades. Oh. I think of uh, body bags of support, and I think of guard duty. I, I think of uh, my, uh, my first flight to, uh, to AmeriCal. I was in the AmeriCal division, and we supported the first of the six, 196, and the area was uh, Shula, Fubai, and Duck 4. I think it was very, very important for us to, to think about what we call mission, and that, that mission was very, very simple. Uh, we had a, a war to fight, and it was a war that was, uh, there were no really uh, front lines. I thought that everything <laughs> was a front line. From the pulling of guard duty at night uh, to taking you know, the rounds uh, from the VCs at night also. So I think that when, when you think about the faces and, uh, and you think about uh, what you've done, you think about how do you get a person from the battlefield, if you will, to an aid station or to a hospital as quickly as possible. And I think America cut that down from uh, Korea to Vietnam, I think it was like 10 minutes or so. I think about uh, the kind of injuries in Vietnam were traumatic amputations. Uh, when I say that, I mean not only legs, but uh, also arms. And I think that uh, the, the idea in terms of the day to life is to get through and make it to the next day. Uh, we all had a saying about, I can't wait until I go back to, quote, uh, the world. So getting, getting through the daily life, and remember, we didn't have uh, the whole idea of cell phones. We didn't have Skype. We maybe had mail call, you know, twice a week. So it was, it was, it was, it was very, very isolated. But what held you together, or what held me together, was, was understanding that I was part of a, uh, a tradition that went back to the Revolutionary War. And I think I belong to a great uh, fraternity of, of soldiers who served. And I think that when, when you look and think about the day to life, which I really haven't talked about since, uh, since I left uh, Vietnam, it is about service, it's about putting up with just the continuances of war, which in my case is, is the, um, the whole idea of helicopters, blades. And we also did med caps to the, to the Vietnamese, Vietnamese people. So uh, when I think about that, that is what I think about. Ike, you had two tours, I understand, and so a, a variety of experiences in a variety of contexts. Yeah, well, my daily life uh, was different from the first tour to the second tour. Uh, second tour, of course, I, I was a prisoner of war. Uh, <clears throat> first tour was mostly combat missions and uh, combat patrols and reconnaissance of uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, interdicting mm -hmm. the enemy's lines of communication. And, of course, trying to stay alive, but the... Uh, Second tour, when I was captured, uh, I would just try to find ways to mess with the enemy, even though I was a prisoner of war. I became the prisoner of war camp scamp, according to them, because I was always doing crazy things. 
Uh, for example, uh, I broke the rice mill and they found out that it was me, but I, I wasn't about to mill all that rice that they had there. And uh, I got pretty tiresome. And the, the other thing about daily life is just mainly trying to stay alive and survive, uh, try to beat the odds. We, had, uh, we were affected by the uh, jungle borne diseases. I had malaria, hepatitis, beriberi, and a big, strong case of dysentery. Oh, yes. So, <clears throat> we were just trying to survive in, in prison of war camp. I always kept my, my mind very open and developed a plan to escape, and I finally escaped. Ken, I know you were a POW as well for a period of time. Tell us about... Well, you know, I did two tours also, uh, similar to Ike, that, you know, the military can do its best to train you. But in the end result, it's not like OJT. You know, when I landed at Cameron Bay and got off that airplane, it was so hot and dry. Mm -hmm. and, said, and Cameron Bay is a beautiful, beautiful place in, in Vietnam. And then eventually you know, flew down to Kuchi and was there for uh, a couple of uh, weeks while I was in processing. You know, I went to Vietnam, I'm a military brat, which means that my dad was in the military and I went in the military afterwards. And we all know how controversial the war was, literally divided this country. And, you know, but I felt as an American citizen, it is my duty, when Uncle Sam calls, you serve irregardless of what the conflict is. And a lot of people chose to you know, run off to other countries. President Carter let these guys back in, unfortunately. But you know, I went because duty called, duty served. And so on my first tour of duty, I was a sniper. And we'd go out on five to seven man teams. And, you know, and, and this is a war too, remember. Number one was never declared by Congress. We fought it with one hand tied behind our back. For example, we weren't supposed to be in Cambodia. We were in Cambodia. The first unit I was with had just come back after a six month tour of duty in, uh, from Cambodia. And all they did, all we did is really delay the inevitable. But when we go out on these five to seven man teams and sit up in, in, in the jungle environment, we'd never fought a jungle warfare in our lives. So this is a new experience. And so when you're sitting there and you're waiting for the enemy because there's you know, intelligence that the enemy's been moving through this area, and then, I, and I tell school kids this, killing is never right, but I was military trained and government issued to do a job and I did it pretty good. But when you sit there and see the enemy crossing a path and you squeeze that trigger and you see them drop, that really sets a tone for the rest of your duty. And after a while, it just became natural. And then so I said, you know, I like this you know, military stuff you know, so well, I'm gonna extend and you know, come back. And I had to come home for 30 days. And then all I had to do was another seven months of tour. And then I would get out of the military five months early. Uh, my second tour is with MACV, or Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, uh, stationed out of uh, Loch Ninh, North, uh, South Vietnam, which is 75 miles uh, north of Saigon. And so uh, six days before my discharge, my camp of four Americans, 200 South Vietnamese soldiers, got hit with 30,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers. This was 1972. They had the goal then, during the spring offensive of 72, to go to Saigon like they did in 1968. We just happened to be in their way. But we held that camp for three days before driving Russian tanks, and they literally overran the camp. And I lost two men on my uh, five-man team. And we wouldn't let any helicopters land because it was just too hot. Mm. And so we went into hiding. They found us the next day, started pouring gasoline on top of the bunker we were in. And of course, you know, if you start smelling gasoline, well, on top of cocktail, those kind of things. So we exited. And then, uh, and, you know, probably uh, Ike and I are maybe a couple of people in this whole program that have fought against the enemy, and we have lived with the enemy. And so we have... And I'm not saying this boastfully, I say it very humbly, a very unique experience. And we learned uh, what communism is all about from the enemy's perspective. So it literally changed my life because I went to Vietnam because I was supposed to. 
But what literally changed my mind, and even to this day, I was agnostic when I went. Mm. And on that second day of a three-day battle, when I realized, and I can remember this day, uh, that day as I'm sitting here today, and I started praying. And we've all heard the adage, there's no atheists in foxholes, battlefield conversions. Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at one of them. Because there, there was nothing I could physically do to get out of there. And you just start praying. You raise a very interesting question uh, that might be a, a good thing for us to explore a little bit. Uh, I too was with the Vietnamese. I was an advisor uh, to a regional infantry force in the Mekong Delta. So my daily life was spent with the Vietnamese. I was with an advisory team, but it was a small team. And our interactions with the Vietnamese were ubiquitous and they were daily and they were constant. Um, I went to training at Fort Bragg, learned some language, some other things having to do with Vietnamese culture. But I have to say, when I got there, I didn't feel very well prepared for what I found. And I wonder how you all felt about that in terms of your own activities. Did you feel well-trained, ready for what you saw, or were there things that surprised you fundamentally and uh, made your experiences much different from what you expected, Liz? The real deal is you can't see here what you saw there. One of the things uh, that, that was the most difficult for me was how do you handle an 18-year-old with no legs and no arms? How do you handle that? And that is a one-shot wound. And it always happens on tanks because they sit with their arms down. And as the missile hits this side, it goes, takes off both arms and both legs. And remember, this is an 18-year-old with no arms and no legs. And I'm the one thing, I, because I'm gonna get to talk again, trust me. <laughs> but when I look at what happened here, because I have to tell you, I had two brothers in Vietnam at the same time. The government didn't know and they weren't willing to give me up. My grandmother almost lost it. She has three grandchildren. My grandmother raised us in war at the same time. And that was a very difficult place for her. The other thing, and I am gonna bring race into the issue. You know, when a young male, whether he's black or white, gets into trouble, they offer him the military rather than prison. And so here he comes, 18 years old, and gets assigned to the wolfhounds, or he gets assigned to uh, an outpost area where they sit in that boiling sun all day. And you know the movie, what was that movie? about Vietnam. There were lots of movies about no, Vietnam. No, you know, that, 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 the, the one that really got to me, where they carried everybody off in the little bitty white bags and stuff, it didn't happen like that. Because the plane would come in and they would throw off all of the body bags because he got to go pick up some more. We actually, America, with as much money, as much skill, and as much stuff as we have, we ran out of bandages, we ran out of water, we ran out of medicine, some slept on the floor. And I always used to think, if you all would quit that damn marching and get something done so that we can do something that we need to do because all of those people, all of those guys belonged to somebody before they came. 
and there was nothing we could do about that. And I'm going to talk about Ted, because it was the, our guys in the North that knew about Ted. The South did not know about, South, about Ted. And when the first rounds came in, we did not know what to do. We did not have the supplies to handle that. And being as I had the surgical units, when you see that much carnage and no way to stop it, and you look at it every day, every night, you look at it, and it makes sleep real difficult for people like me. And this is the first time, I, bet I understand this is the first time they've asked a female who was in Nam on the front line to have something to say because we act like we didn't have it. And I, I'm, I'm let, me, let me say one, okay. one, one little thing <laughs> because you need to say, when I came back, an adult came up to me and says, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure, what? She says, were they really shooting real bullets? I thought, and what did you do during the war? John, were there things that surprised you that you didn't feel prepared for that came to you as a kind of out of the blue that uh, well, I, don't, important? I don't think there's any way to prepare for war. I think that the, uh, the training that we went through was what most soldiers have gone through. That is, uh, we were fighting an enemy and uh, we were there to, uh, to kill the enemy. And I think that training meant that uh, whether it was whatever war, that you don't see them necessarily as people. Uh, you have to have a renegotiation in the training of, you know, I'm on my way to Vietnam, I'm on my way to kill a Charlie Khan. And I think that uh, uh, the training is almost wrong. But my, like my colleague said here, it becomes second nature. And I think what, what uh, we did well was to, was to train in terms of on the, on the weapon side but it was a different kind of war mm -hmm. that we had, we had fought over the years. It was different from World War II. Plus, we had the rotation system where we went there as individuals rather as, yeah. as units. Mm -hmm. So if you divide the training into uh, the psychology part, you are a soldier, and, you, and your deal is to <clears throat> not to ask why, but to do or die. And then you add the training of what you need to do, uh, whether it's, in my case, learning how to do uh, bandages or, or learning how to do guard duty or learning how to go on med cap or learning how to put, uh, take people in and out of uh, helicopters. And I think that became uh, good. So I think that uh, in terms of uh, the preparation, I think that the American soldiers did extremely well. I think that we had problems back at home with the, uh, with the demonstrators and the Congress. So I think that if you look at what we were trained for, because I think we won every, 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 every battle. Uh, so I you think, think that uh, the training itself was good, but there's absolutely no way, there's no, no, no way to train for being a prisoner of war. There's no way to train for all of the mass kinds of uh, uh, destruction uh, that you see. Uh, whether it's standing there and watching a beautiful field and, and when, the, uh, Marine help, when the Marine pilots do their jobs and the Air Force, it's just all barren. Yeah. So I think that uh, uh, one other training that we went through was uh, uh, understanding that although you were fighting uh, the Vietnamese, we had a med cap that is you had to be kind to the Vietnamese people because it was that kind of war. And, and, and that training for me, went, uh, I would go to villages and I would engage uh, the Vietnam, Vietnamese people, but I was always aware that everybody was the enemy because uh, as Liz and I were talking in the green room, uh, it was the kids who would also uh, blow you up. Yeah. So I think that's important. So the training was good for what we knew, but I think that we've learned more about uh, that kind of warfare. Ike, what surprised you? What, what was sort of well, outside of your expectations? I came from a different uh, outfit than these guys here, but uh, I was in Special Forces, and we do some uh, extensive area studies before we go into whatever country we're going to go. 
uh, to include survival language, uh, study of the terrain, the mountains, the river, flow of the current on the rivers, which way they're headed, who we're going to see, who we're going to meet, what they talk, what they like, what they don't like, and so forth. So we do this for about six months before we right. deploy. Right. So our, our special forces teams are pretty well prepared, un unless they, you know, the mission changes when you're en route out there, but uh, most of the time we'll, we'll land and, and go ahead with a mission to our designated areas. Uh, <clears throat> we had the, uh, the problem with the mountain yards was that we, everything that we taught those people, we had to go to the, to the interpreter and then that interpreter would go into French, the French would go into their lingo, their dialect. And so when, when we trained, uh, for example, uh, camp defenses, you're, you're talking to, in English to, to a, a guy that speaks Vietnamese in English and so forth down the line until it gets, well, a lot of that stuff gets lost in the translation. You know? yeah. But uh, I think that we were very well prepared uh, to, to do our job and our mission. And, uh, some of these other units, I later learned, uh, thought that they were going to go in country and find some little oriental guy, you know, with a third world class weapon. <laughs> but they were probably thinking about, you know, the Viet Cong, the VC. But you can't differentiate the North Vietnamese from the South Vietnamese. They all look alike, you know. I kind of had it uh, a little bit closer and I got in, in, into them kind of tight because of the color of my skin. See, those guys would pull up their arm and put their arm against me and they kind of say, hey, we're the same, same, you know? That we. Yeah, we're, we're kind of like buddies. But uh, we were very well trained uh, to, to, to encounter the mission that we were in. But uh, in reality, the North Vietnamese soldiers were the best fighting soldiers of, in, in this entire world. I can vouch for that. And they had hunger for victory. Because in the long run up north, they had told them, you know, Ho Chi Minh's dream is to unite North and South Vietnam. And his staff was also told that way. So in case Ho Chi, when he died, the next guy in command would do that. And they promised themselves that until the last man would be standing there was killed, but they were going to reunify the country. And so they did. And they fought very hard. Compared to the soldiers in the South, yeah. They were nothing. These kids were trained to drop their guns and run. Leaving us there, the special forces guys, to defend themselves you know, against a, an enemy that uh, was very well trained. And it happened in a, in a lot of instances. We talk about the, uh, the tanks, you know. When I came back, I was given some good intelligence because I was the first prisoner of war to come back and really explain to them what I had found out I had realistic and truthful intelligence. And I, I told him about the tanks. And the, the little kid from the MI says, oh, how do you know they weren't ours? I said, my God, man, what kind of fool are you? You know, the tank, you can hear a tank right there at the President of War Camp. <laughs> Would have been long gone into Cambodia. But anyway, at my debriefing, I told him about that they had armor. Uh, Bill Craig, another Special Forces soldier, was at Long Bay. And when the tanks hit Long Bay, they knocked out those three Russian tanks. And down the road, Bill thanked me a lot. He said, you know what, I read your report, and thank you for the intel, you know, because nobody was prepared to fight some tanks, but when tanks came over, they had 3.5s and all 57s, and of course, the mines to, to repel the tank attack. So they come up smelling like a rose. Ken, what surprised you? What was outside your expectations that you had to deal with? Yeah, you, know, you stop and think about Vietnam, the location, 10,000 miles away from the United States of America that until the war started, no one had ever heard of. You know, we weren't the first there. Yeah, right. That's right. And the if French. you look at history, they defeated the French, mm -hmm. Genghis Khan, before them and for them. So time was on their side. They figured they could out, you know, wait us, if you will. How many lives are we willing to spend in a futile effort as an end result? But I can remember going through villages and, and, and keep in mind, some of you that maybe uh, worked in Vietnam, $400 a year is all they lived off of. And they're living on uh, dirt floors, grass huts, no electricity, no indoor plumbing. 
just you know, hardworking, dedicated people. All the local South Vietnamese people wanted is just to exist. And they got caught in the crosshairs. And you see kids that the Viet Cong had shot and wounded, you know, but they wanted to hang out with us because they didn't like the NVA or the Viet Cong. And as I said, you know, the, I could always tell the difference between the NVA and the Viet Cong. NVA wore uniforms, the Viet Cong didn't. They, we we kind of said they were the farmers by day, fighters at night. And so, you know, when we got to prison camp in Cambodia, deep in the jungles of Cambodia, and I was put in a five by six tiger cage with a 10 foot chain locked around on my, my ankles. I'd been there probably in 17 shrapnel wounds. Uh, the first time I was interviewed, now, keep in mind, there's five tiger cages. There's a guard stand with a kid, probably about 14, 15, 16 years of age, with an AK-47. Uh, and so the guy that took care of us spoke English fairly well. And he came and took me. We went a long story short. I went inside for about an hour and a half, sitting on a tree stump about six inches off the ground. And this guy's sitting at a uh, bamboo table in a, a chair. And, of course, generally speaking, the South Vietnamese uh, folks and Vietnamese people are short in stature. So as soon as he sat down, I immediately figured out this guy's got superior position on me because I'm having to look up at him. So over the next hour and a half during that first session, you know, they go, well, we wish you could go home, but there's a war going on and yada, yada, yada. And so he starts getting down to, well, who are you with? What units and so forth? So you start making up stuff. But it was enough for him to say, and it wasn't true or accurate, he said, well, is it with this unit, this unit? Now, this guy is speaking Vietnam, uh, English better than most Americans. And so we do this, I call this a little dance because I tried to put a positive on negative situation. I knew someday I was coming home. I didn't know when. But I made the mental uh, decision, I'm going to beat this thing. I don't know how long, but I will go home. So attitude, I live every day Every day is a great day. If you're thinking you're having a bad day, let me tell you one day as a PO day. I say that humbly. But after we finished this, and, and you know, he asked me about some propaganda uh, material that they uh, shared with me about some battles that I'd actually been in. And I said, well, I have to disagree with you on this one particular battle. You guys didn't win. He looks, leans forward and looks at me with all seriousness. Oh, no. You have been misled by that propaganda machine we've got in this country called the free press. Now, I'm 25, I'm kind of cocky, but I'm in no position to be cocky in that environment. And I'm thinking to myself, you've got to be kidding me. And that's when it really sunk in, because they reiterated it later on. Even if something is false, communist doctrine, if you repeat it a thousand and one times, it becomes true. And I said to myself, Wow. So, as I mentioned before, you're know, fighting with them, living with them, seeing their perspective, and knowing that uh, you know maybe someday we'll go home. Not sure when. Fortunately, like Ike or like Ike, he was fortunate to escape. I couldn't figure out how to get out of there, get off the chain, get out of the the camp that had punji stakes on the inside. And plus, it was late in the war. President Nixon was taking 10,000 troops out a month, and we had about 150, 183,000, 180,000 troops in uh, 1972. So. Uh, we said, we're going to give it a year and see if it works out, and then we try and anticipate escape. Yeah. John, you and, and Ken have both raised the important question of what we heard and knew about what was happening in the United States and how that affected daily experience. I, I think that would be a good thing to explore. I would just remind everybody that, as somebody has already said, uh, there was no television. <laughs> uh, there was no regular contact. Uh, letters took about a week. Uh, there were no telephone calls. Uh, there was Vietnam radio <laughs> in Saigon and made famous in the, in the movie Good Morning Vietnam and in that story. But there was, most of the information came slowly and it was difficult to know immediately what was happening at home. But we did hear ultimately, of course, about everything that was going on. And there was a lot going on, at least when I was there in 1968-69, the anti-war movement was... Uh, really get, becoming very powerful. And uh, so we, we heard more and more things about what was happening in the United States, and of course it had an effect on us. I'm wondering how it affected each of you 
Liz, if you could talk a little bit about how that news, to, to the degree that you had news, how that affected your daily life. I, I, I want to answer that question intelligently. We didn't get no daily news. What daily news? The only kind of news we had was about the people marching over here. That's what I mean. That, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we heard that all the time. And I'm being a lady, so I'm not going to cuss today. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to hold that back. You know what I'm saying? We didn't get any, any of that kind of stuff. There was some radio stuff that we got that we, we, we knew what music was going on in the States. But there seemed to be no way to get any information back to the States so that they could get off their duff and do something that was helpful. Does that, does that make sense? And so we didn't really get that much radio, especially because I was always out in the, in, in the field. I didn't want to go to Saigon. They wanted me to go to Saigon to work. I told them I could stay at home and do this. And so radios didn't work. Um, so we didn't get any of, the, any of that kind of, kind of stuff. Most of the stuff that I heard, because I have to tell you, I had two brothers also in the war at the same time. So there were three of us in the war at the same time. Really wore my grandmother down but they were Navy and I was Army. <laughs> and so we just didn't get that kind of thing and there wasn't the kind of wiring in the heavy war zones that would allow radio and that kind of stuff to come through. So we didn't know much until the very, very end about what was going on here. Um, and I have to tell you, I, I was sort of glad we didn't get to hear it. Um, because when you got 30 guys with their bellies open, butts broken, eyes blinded, I don't want to hear any about that mess, okay? Because I really did have something to do. Does, you, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I, I had something to do besides stand around and talk about what y'all wasn't going to do. because the 25th Infantry was a mighty infantry group. It really was. And we had special forces, the 25th, and they were always in battle. I don't think there was one day that I was there that they were not in battle. But my grandmother would let me know what they were saying here. And what I understood was saying here didn't have a damn thing to do with what was going on. And uh, I used to think, if y'all could get from in front of that television and send us some supplies, I sure would be thankful. <laughs> John, how about you? What, Wait, what, was yeah, your, yeah, what did, did you hear and how did had, it affect you? We had your Stars and Stripes, uh, but of course, uh, you're not too concerned about uh, are debating that, but, but certainly we had the Stars and Stripes, and, uh, and the reality came when I was in Seattle and I got the briefing. And the briefing was, take your uniform off and watch out for the hippies. You're in a different kind of situation. situation. And I think that uh, the war divided itself, and it also divided itself between GIs who, uh, who thought that uh, people should serve, and then there were people who were protesting and going to, um, and going to Canada. Uh, at my undergraduate school, uh, there were not lots of protests against the war. Um, I went straight from, from the military to Northwestern University to graduate school, and, uh, and I wore my, uh, you know, my jacket because, because it was cold. <laughs> and I, I think that uh, the idea of, uh, of serving in Vietnam always put it in the forefront. I mean, I have it on my resume now. My favorite story is I was the veteran of the game for the Kansas State game here at the University of Texas, and the veterans called me and asked, how could a decorated Vietnam veteran be a professor at the University of Texas? <laughs> so I think that uh, Paul Woodruff, another good friend of mine, is also a decorated veteran. But I think that uh, I really didn't uh, begin to think about it, because when you're there, you're thinking about your duty. But I tell you, when you got home, you can see 
a different kind of vision. But it wasn't too interruptive when you were there. There wasn't a... Mm -hmm. No, I think that... I looked it. at it personally about people who did not want to serve. And I thought uh, from an uh, from academic point of view, I thought that the, that the country was changing. Uh, I had, uh, you know, you go back to the Revolutionary War, you had the same kind of dynamics but a different level. And, uh, you know, the resentment is that, uh, you know, my, my heroes are the, are, the, are the people that I serve with and not the people who, uh, who demonstrated. But that's okay, you know, that's my personal uh, kind of resentment. I know it's a free country and you can do what you want to do, but in terms of um, what I've done and, and what I did, my heroes are the people who did not come home and the people who were maimed and the people who were, you know, traumatized rather than the people who refused to fight uh, uh, for America. And, and I ha also have reservations about uh, President Carter uh, allowing people to come back in full citizenship. But I think that kind of attitude is indicative when you, when you begin to cut through the layers of, of uh, what the experience in Vietnam was. But I think that the, the reality of, uh, of what happened in the war and the reality of all the demonstrations that took place I think it's a historical question as to what went on. You know, I went to Houston to give a talk in Southwest Houston, and I was pleased because there was a statue in the Vietnamese uh, community of, a, of an American soldier. So I think that uh, it didn't affect me there because I was uh, solidarity was with the troops, and certainly was not with the uh, the protesters. Yeah, Ike, how about you? Did, did were you again, aware of what was happening? Did it yeah, affect again, you? Again, I think we had an edge over the conventional units because uh, we used Morse code. Our combo shack with each one of our teams has a communicator that's an expert in Morse code. Mm. Yeah. And uh, he would get the message, and I'll give you a good example. When President Kennedy was assassinated, minutes after he was shot, we knew about it. Mm. The, uh, the message came in, he deciphered it, and he read it to the captain, said, you know, President Kennedy's been assassinated, uh, shot in Dallas. More to follow, when he passes away in the hospital, we get the message that he's gone. It's just, you know, a small amount of time. But conversely, the enemy had very good communications. They had access to the Chicago be. Tribune, the Washington <laughs> Post, Times. And, and you know what? It, it hurt, hurt me real bad because I had, I had uh, BS my way into telling them when they were uh, interrogating me that I was just a supply man. So all I do is, you know, give uniforms and whenever they need boots, I give them boots and all this stuff. So I kind of sold them on that story, and I said, well, I think I got over on these guys, you know. One day they called me in, and like Ken said, here, you're sitting in a little stump like that, and that guy's way up there. He said, you've been telling us that all you did, that you were a supply man, that you gave them boots and uniforms and all this stuff? He said, yes. I said, yes, and so he picks up a copy of Time magazine. And he says, you know, are you familiar with this publication? I said, yes, Time Magazine, sir. News, news uh, Magazine. He said, he threw it at me and says, turn to page uh, 19. It's page 19. There was a picture of my cap burning right after the attack. And on the bottom caption of that photo, it said, where Sergeant First Class Isaac Camacho was teaching anti-guerrilla warfare. <laughs> I didn't know how to respond to that thing, but only one thing I said, you know, I said, well, you can't believe everything you read. <laughs> There's your brother. <laughs> and we then, he said, now, now we really want to talk. You know, that serious. I bet they did. <laughs> and and I, I mentioned to him, I said, remember when the first days that when I was here with you guys, I said, remember, I told you that I had seen a bus that was exploded by a uh, mine that you guys blew up the bus with civilians in it, and it was what about five miles south of Kantum. I read that in in, a, in the Saigon paper, and he told me, he said, "Well, you know, you Americans are, are so ignorant. It's just propaganda, and you know, you're not supposed to believe everything you read." And so that was my <laughs> second comeback. Remember, you told me <laughs> not to believe everything you read, and it left me alone. <laughs> Ken, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about you know, what you were hearing and did it alter your experience? Did it influence your experience? You know, like a lot of these folks and people that served in Vietnam, you know, you got the stars and stripes, you were back in base camp. You know, when I was in prison camp, uh, my parents wrote me letters. I wrote uh, 
a couple letters, you know, they give you a little five by seven piece of paper with five lines on it. You know, well, what are you going to say? You know, I'm deep in the jungles of Cambodia. Things aren't going real well. You know, everything's <laughs> fine. I hope to be, you know, the food could be better, but I understand. I knew those letters were never going to leave. Every afternoon, and again, I tried to put a positive on a negative situation because, number one, I was glad to be alive. Every afternoon after siesta time, they would come back and unlock the cages. Now, I had a 10-foot chain around one of my ankles locked to the cage itself and it never came off unless I went to the bathroom or bathed every 10 days. This, uh, I'll call my little friend to be nice, would come in in the center of the camp and play this transistor radio. The voice of Vietnam, straight from Hanoi. Mm. Of course, it wasn't biased or anything. <laughs> and I can remember very clearly because uh, this was during 72 when you had the presidential elections going on. You had a guy named Richard Nixon, and on the Democratic side, you had a guy named George McGovern. Well, again, going back to what I said earlier, they distort, as uh, Ike said, the truth. Because it sounded like this you know, young lady on the, uh, from Hanoi that George McGovern was gonna win the 72 election. I think maybe he carried three states. One of them wasn't even his own. But it talked a lot about the protesters, the anti-American sentiment. But you had to kind of filter that stuff out. Even though, and I'm going to be nice, you had a guy on the program the other morning that was married to a famous actress. <laughs> hey, I have a different word that I will not share in public for that individual. She... <laughs> Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda did not help our cause. In fact, they played Jane's recorded message for 30 days. And I will never forget when she ended her transmitting, you know, talking about, well, these are poor, innocent people. There was POWs in North Vietnam, as you already know, that were tortured, that refused to meet with her. She never did come down to South Vietnam, Cambodia, or whatever. But her ending statement was, and Ramsey Clark, who I talked to, you know, your mother, uh, Lucy and Linda, uh, who was embarrassed that the attorney general under your dad went over there. But I go to bed crying every night thinking of the damage we have done to these poor, innocent people. I said, really? And I know okay. she's apologized. I'll leave it at that. But, you know, we talk about Vietnam veterans being recognized today because we didn't start the war. We served each and every one here today and those around the world that wore the uniform during that time period should be applauded, should be saluted, and thanked for your service because <laughs> if you were drafted, you went, some didn't obviously. I volunteered because I felt it was my responsibility and duty. But I tell you what, lessons learned, and I talked to a guy last night with the San Antonio paper, Lessons learned going forward, I think we're witnessing that today to a certain degree. I don't necessarily agree with what's going on militarily. But the men and women serving today, and 12 to 15% of the people serving today are females, which I think is great and wonderful. Number two, they all volunteer. There's no draft. And Vietnam veterans, older veterans, and even the public in general is thanking these young men and women when they come through airports or they're in a restaurant, they're in their uniform, I think we've come a long way and hopefully we can take some of those lessons forward. Besides, let's not get into something that the country is not fully committed, there's no vital interest in the United States, let's not play political politics with it, let's not find with one hand tied behind our back and let's go in and win it immediately. I think it, you're right. You know, we, are, I, we are doing a lot better. Uh, yeah, I think the other part, around, but, the part, uh, the part about, I'm sorry, babe. <laughs> she gets one minute. Uh -uh. <laughs> We've only got a couple left. So we okay, got, so I'm yeah. only, only take one. And that, I, because I want to piggyback on what you have to say. And that is, this country here just got so flared up when a kid was killed. A Vietnamese kid was killed. But we never said a word when the Vietnamese kid 
would hold up a, co a Coke can to a U.S. soldier, and that can was a bomb. And we got them all the time. They would throw those Coke cans. And to this day, Vietnam vets who were in prison, and I do, work, do a lot of work with prisons, the one thing you cannot do is hand them a Coke can and say, here, because it pulls back that memory of that kid. But we could get all pissed off about a U.S. guy killing a Vietnamese kid. But we never said a word when the Vietnamese kids threw those bombs in the tops of those APCs and tanks and guys riding on the sides of the truck. And we tried really hard to take care of those kids, but those kids blew up a lot of U.S. troops. And we have to think about what we think about kids because kids do what their parents tell them to do. And that is not always what kids do that you know about. And I have taken care of a lot of GIs who were wounded, who lost their legs, who were blind from a Coke can. And I still have trouble with Coke. Thank you. I, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and have the last word here, because <laughs> we're very close to the end. Uh, I think one of the difficult things, surely one of the very difficult things about the experience of being there was that even people there in the field executing their mission in the best possible way they could and with great integrity and, and bravery had very divided feelings about mm -hmm. what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, some people were very supportive. Some people were in the middle. Some people weren't so supportive. One of the complexities of the legacy of this war, I think, is that even among the people who fought it, there was hugely divided sentiment about the experience, what it meant, what it was for, its purpose. And going back to what Ken said, I think that for me, coming away from that, the most important lesson is that we have to make sure that as a people and a country, we understand what the ultimate meaning of our engagement is uh, because uh, without that certainty, the price is too high mm -hmm. and the uh, pain is too great. And so if there's one thing I think probably we all agree on as veterans of that conflict is that going forward we have to make sure that that's where we find ourselves when we're making these decisions. I want you to join me in thanking these panelists for their excellent work. And thanks all of you for coming. Thank you.